seven, okay? And uh, my grandmother was the one that raised me, and I, I, we always had a very, very close, close relationship. I think I mentioned the other day, she was a Polish woman. She was about 4'11", both ways, and she was just a wonderful, wonderful grandma. When she got in her 80s, her mind started to go. And so we would, anytime I was going through Pennsylvania near Tunkhannock, I would always stop at the nursing home where she was, and she was strong physically. She'd stick her arm through my arm, always carried her purse in the other arm, and we'd march up and down the halls, and I'd say, well, Graham, how you doing? And she'd look at me and give me a big smile and say, life is but a dream. I said, how's the food here? She'd look at me and say, life is but a dream. Now, when she was about 85, or excuse me, 95, she had a new boyfriend. He's a lot, lot younger. He was like 90 or something like that, okay? And I said, I met your boyfriend out in the, out in the lobby, and he's kind of cute. She smiled and said, life is but a dream. It didn't matter what I said. All she could say is, life is but a dream. We got into the main lobby. There was a piano there. My son was with me. So he sat down by the piano and said, hey, Josh, play one of her favorite songs, Amazing Grace. So he started to play. Her eyes lit up, and she took her hands like she was the one playing. And when we got done, I said, Graham, you did great. And she smiled and said, life is but a dream. I said, play your all-time favorite, favorite song, How Great Thou Art. So he started to play it. And I'm not that great of a singer, but I thought, I'm going to sing it to her. And I was just kind of sitting real close to her, holding both hands, staring at her. And I just started singing, oh, Lord, my God. And all of a sudden, she started singing with me. Every single word, all the way through the first verse, all the way through the chorus. I'm crying. I'm saying, yes, God brought her mind back. And we got done. And I said, Graham, that was wonderful. And she said, Life is but a dream. I said, oh, I know that song, Row, Row, Row Your Boat, but that's, I, I like this song better. And she said, so do I, because it has more of God in it. I said, Graham. And she said, life is but a dream. I only saw her one more time before she went off into eternity. And by this time, she was sitting in a wheelchair, just staring, not speaking at all. And I remember down getting down on one knee like this and kind of looking in her eyes. And seriously, it was like looking at tunnels of time. And as I'm looking in her eyes and trying to make her smile, all of a sudden she just started shaking. And she brought her little hand up and she said, you're my people. She raised me. I was special to her. She was special to me. My Bible says, Christian, you're a holy nation. You're a peculiar people. And your God loves you so very, very much, and he'll never forget about you. And I hope we reciprocate that love. This week, we've had the joy of spending, beginning with the teens, how to love God more. And then we talked about how to fear him. And then the importance of getting to know him. We talked about pride and how that totally hinders us from receiving that that grace of God that comes okay and as we walk through all these issues of life we do we come down to one simple truth that should be probably one of the greatest ways we can express our love to the Lord but as we begin that we got to look at this why don't we express our love like we should what are we so afraid what is the difference between a phobia and a fear? A phobia is literally a fear on steroids. It totally, totally paralyzes you and keeps you from doing what you know you should do, okay? Now, in studying this, and I wrote a book called Fear Not, Meditation on Fear, I came across some things online that I didn't even realize there were as many phobias out there as I thought. And here's a list of some of them that I thought were kind of unusual. Arachnophobia, that's what? Fear of spiders. Autodisomophobia, that's the fear of somebody who has a vile odor. Um, scolionophobia, how many of you have scolionophobia? Okay, let me explain it. That means that's the fear of going to school. How many have scolionophobia? I thought so. Androphobia, musophobia, are about the same. One is the fear of men, the other is the fear of mice. Um, <laughs> Catoptrophobia is actually the fear of looking into a mirror. And again, these are all listed in the psychological, psychological journal. I didn't make these up. Lachanophobia, I do struggle with a little bit. Lachanophobia is the fear of vegetables. 
Now, I love vegetables. You know, french fries, onion rings. I'm really big on vegetables, but emetophobia, this is kind of gross. Emetophobia is the fear of throwing up or blowing chunks in public, okay? And I think most of us have that. Zemiphobia is the fear of rats. Now, it wasn't quite a rat, but years ago at camp, we used to have tents and platforms. And one girl who is now a missionary woke up at 2 in the morning, very uncomfortable. She woke up, and a skunk had gotten into the tent and walked and was sitting right on her, looking at her nose. What do you do if you wake up and there's a skunk looking at you? Hopefully nothing quick, okay? Uh, let's see. A blutophobia is actually the fear of taking a bath or a shower. It's called seventh and eighth grade boys, okay? <laughs> a chlorophobia, uh, that's, uh, that's actually the fear of cats, okay? How many of you have cats at home? Let me see your hands. Why? Actually, actually, I love cats. I really do. It normally depends on the way they're cooked, but I really do love cats, okay? <laughs> Electrophobia is the fear of chickens. Um, Anuptophobia is the fear of staying single the rest of your life, okay? And the last one, I just like saying it, arachibutyrophobia. Try to say it with me. Arachibutyrophobia. It's actually the fear of peanut butter sticking to the roof of your mouth. These are all real phobias that paralyze people and keep them from doing what they really should do. But tonight, we're going to look at one more. It's called marturiophobia. And the word marturia is actually a Greek word, and it is found in Scripture, and it is the fear of witnessing. Now, you know the fear of chickens and cats looking in mirrors and going to school? It's easy to laugh at those. But this one is not funny. It really isn't. Marturiophobia, the fear of witnessing. Why are we so hesitant to share the most important truth in all the universe why, I could put it this way, are we so selfish? We know Christ. We know the truth. And, and it makes a difference literally for eternity. And, and we kind of keep it to ourselves. Do you know God has an answer to this? For God has not given us a spirit of, the Greek word is phobos, phobia. You say, Rand, um, okay. Okay. You don't know me. I'm just a shy person. God has not given the spirit of fear. But you see, Rand, you don't understand, because I, I get all confused and tongue-tied when I try to talk to people. God has not given the spirit of fear. But you see, Rand, I work in a situation that you really get blasted if you even try. God does not give us the spirit of fear. If you fear sharing Christ with others, folks, you cannot blame that on God. Instead, what has he given us? The spirit or the attitude of power and of love and of a sound mind. Would you say the last verse with me there? Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Does it embarrass you that you're a Christian? Does it scare you when the people you go to school with and work with and have fun with know that you truly, truly love God? God has not given us the spirit of fear, folks. He really hasn't. When you love something a lot, you can't wait to share that with others. Yeah? Do you love your God? Again, what keeps us from sharing Christ? God has not given the spirit of fear, but he has given the spirit of power if we'll just take it. He literally will give you the courage. Paul said, I am not, say the next word, ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. I'm not ashamed of this wonderful, precious message of what Jesus has done for us. One missionary in the 1040 window, he's seeing great fruit in a Muslim world. And they ask him, how do you do this? 
And he very humbly said, well, we pray and we meet people and we tell them about Jesus. And then we pray and we meet people and we tell them about Jesus. I'm not ashamed of the good news, the gospel that will make the difference for a person spending eternity in heaven or hell. Wow. If any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be, say it, ashamed, but let him glorify God in this behalf. So you guys, you're at work and you share Christ and everybody goes, oh, and they start to give you a hard time and mock you. Do you know how wonderful that is? So you're at school and you share Christ with your friends or invite them out to the single and on this Saturday and you pass out a couple of tracks and you carry your Bible and they start mocking you and picking on you because you're a Christian. Do you know how wonderful that is? Because just like this verse, if you suffer as a Christian, don't be ashamed. Glorify God. Do you realize that if they pick on you, you are the closest thing to God that they know of? Wow. In fact, you're the one person they know that knows God. And shouldn't that excite your heart? You can tell me that you've met a movie star or an athlete. I'd rather hear that you met God, the creator of the universe, okay? The Lord is on my side. I will not fear what can man do unto me. The Lord is on my side. I'm not going to be afraid. What can man do? You say, Rand, if I witness, they'll shake their head. Let them shake their head. They'll laugh. Let them laugh. They'll hit me. You'll heal. They'll kill me. You'll go to heaven. What are we so afraid of? In the Bible times, do you know we read of some like in Hebrews where the Bible literally says they were pulled apart and sawn asunder? where they would take a Christian and put him in a log, and two men with a cross-cut saw would begin to go back and forth. If the individual refused to turn his back on Christ, they literally would cut him in half. Pulled apart in front of the thousands of people in the Colosseums, they'd take a rope and tie it to both hands and both feet. These ropes would be tied to the back of four different horses. And again, if the individual refused to turn his back on Christ, the slaves would bring the whips down across the back of the horses. They'd run to four different directions and dismember and kill these people. I read of one man where they caught his wife and two boys. They chained him and abused his wife and kids and murdered them in front of his own eyes. And the entire time, he just kept saying, stay faithful to God, stay faithful to God, stay faithful to God. And you know what it takes for us to turn on Christ? Watch me. This is all it takes. That's it. For someone to unfriend me on Facebook or shake their head at me. That's it. For someone not to like me. Aren't you glad that Jesus didn't run and hide when he was called on to die for us? He's, he's weeping droplets of blood, so intense. And even his friends fell asleep. And he's saying, oh, not my will, but Father, your will. And do you realize that even as he hung totally naked on a cross, embarrassed, his body torn apart, the Bible says he despised the shame. That doesn't mean he hated it. He looked down on it. That shame meant nothing to him for the joy that was set before, knowing that he was fulfilling redemption's plan so you and you and you and you and you could be to heaven. Wow. God has not given the spirit of fear, but of power and of love, compassion. You've heard the phrase, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So do you care for you or do you care for others? And if some have compassion, making a difference, and technically it doesn't mean what it says there, where we'll take it, it makes a difference in our life. You know what this literally means? 
And if some have compassion for those who are differing in their mind, we're talking about these kids who are getting to the end of high school and going to college, and what do you believe? Should I be Buddhist, Jehovah Witness, Catholic, Baptist? What should I do? There's so many people crying out, giving me all these different things. I'm differing in my mind, and instead of getting an attitude towards them, so what is your problem? Even those who are raised in their churches who are just trying to find the reality of Christ for themselves. They're differing, they're struggling, and that is the time for a spiritual hug. And not a blasting. There's no fear in love. Perfect love cast out fear. Because fear is torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Wow. Katie, can I pick on you? Good. Katie's 14. I've already teased her. She's in ninth grade. And when I was in ninth grade, 14, I met my wife. <laughs> Could be your year, okay? No. I actually preach against that now. So anyway, just suppose, Katie, down the street from where you live, uh, they're in that housing development. A new family moves in. You can see the moving trucks and all that kind of stuff, okay? And so you just go down to say hi and take them some cookies or something to greet them. And they have a girl your age. And so you think, oh, this would be a great opportunity. So you invite her. Hey, next Saturday, why don't you come over? And uh, we'll hang out at the house a little bit, okay? Maybe play some video games or something. So you got it all planned, and then you're going to have some pizza, okay? And you come, and you're playing some games, and you actually on purpose lose so she's in a good mood, okay? And then you're getting the pizza together because you're going to share the gospel with her. You're going to tell her what Jesus has done for you. And while you're there, and you all of a sudden think, oh, no, if I tell her, she's going to get mad at me. She'll never speak to me again. If I tell her, she'll probably laugh at me and go tell everybody at school. If I share, oh, she's, she'll probably just run out and think I'm a jerk. Katie, if you refuse to share Christ with her, then, then don't tell me that you love her. It's just that you love you more than you love her. But if you invite her over and you're getting to be friends, you're laughing, and then you just look at her and say, hey, I want to tell you probably one of the greatest things that's ever happened to me in my life. It was the day that I realized I was a sinner and found out that God would forgive me. And you share Christ with her. And you think in your heart, I don't care if she laughs at me or mocks me. I really don't care. I don't care if she gets up and storms out of the house. I don't want her to spend eternity separated from God. Perfect love. I tell you, it does. It uh, casts out all fear. So here's what you're going to do. Take your card right now. Everybody take your little white card. Just put your first name in the upper right-hand corner. Get your first name. And this is a real hard thing, okay? Actually, I'm being silly. It's very easy. Put one, two, three. That's it. One, two, three. And then after those three numbers, here's what I want you to do. I want you to write just the first name of someone you know that you see from time to time but they're not a Christian. One of your friends could be a family member, could be a cousin, somebody you work with, somebody a neighbor, somebody you see when you get gas or stop at the store. First name of those three people that do not know Jesus, but you know them personally. Just write one, two, three, okay? Just write it down. I'll give you just a minute. Okay, you got it? All right, look at me. Do you care? Do you really care where they spend eternity? Many, many years ago, there was a girl's face plastered on Time and Newsweek magazine. Her name was Lynette Fromm. She had a nickname called Squeaky. And the way the article went, it went like this. She said, when I was 15, I was a misfit. I didn't fit at home, I didn't fit at a school, I didn't fit in anywhere. So I ran away from home. I found myself sitting on a corner in Whittier, California. While sitting on that street, a man came up to me, put his hand on my head and said, if you follow me, I will take care of you. She said, I believed him. 
and today I would still die for him. His name, Charles Manson, mass murderer. And then in the middle of the article, she wrote this. I decided whoever loved me first could have my life. Those kids go to school next door. Those kids live down the street. People who just want to be loved. Their names are in little cards sitting on your lap. Do you care? Do you really, really care? Do you know nearly half of all high school seniors have used an illegal drug at least once and almost 90% have used alcohol, some on a daily basis? Every 31 seconds, a teen becomes pregnant. Every 20 minutes, a teen is killed in an accident. Every 80 minutes, one is murdered. Every 78 seconds, a teen in America attempts suicide. Every 90 minutes, one succeeds. Do you know why these kids do these things? You say, because they're wicked. They're bad and they're sinful. No, because they are lonely and empty and unloved. Why do you think Facebook is the biggest thing in the world? Because people want friends. You can even list your number of friends on Facebook. And have you ever just jumped on your wall and started giving them the gospel? It's a good way to clear out some friends, I promise you. Do you care? People want to be loved. And God, this is his promise. God doesn't give us that phobos, that fear. But he does put the courage in your heart if you'll accept it. And he does put the compassion in your heart if you'll accept it. But also look at this, confidence and of a sound mind. Because if you're like me, sometimes you get a little bit nervous, like, what do I say? What if they ask me a question I don't know? That is perfect. No, it's not. Yes, it is, but I'll look stupid. Well, we already know that, so don't worry about that one, okay? Do you realize how good it is if they ask you a question you don't know? If they, okay, my daughter, public school, and she, a boy came up to her Catholic boy and said, uh, Anna, did you know that Mary ascended to heaven just in the clouds, just like Jesus did. So what is she supposed to say? You idiot. No, she didn't. No. She very wisely said, oh, really? I didn't know that. Where is that in the Bible? He came back next day because he said he's going to find it. Kind of bleary-eyed. He said, man, I spent hours. I couldn't find it. What else do they teach him at my church that's not in the Bible? And for a while, we started attending our church. They ask you a question that you don't know. And all of a sudden, you just say, you know, that is a great question. I don't know. But I've got a good friend who does. Hey, Saturday, McDonald's. Grab your cell phone, Pastor. Can you meet with me at McDonald's? Yeah. I'm serious. Confidence. What does God say? He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. How many of you know there's not a shadow of doubt in your heart that you are a Christian tonight? Let me see your hands high, okay? Put them down. Just share that. Let me tell you what God did for me. Just talk about God. I've got a bud. He lives within a mile of me. He's 82. He's a true New Englander because he's mean as a snake, but he's loving too. And he's been very faithful to his fifth wife. He really has, okay? And every time I go, hey, Reverend, you want a beer? He's not trying to get me in trouble. He loves me. He does. He said, I don't like preachers, but I like you. And I sit around his fire, and he and his buddies and all of them, they're either drunk or high. I'm serious. You say, why do you go? I'll sit around that circle, fire going, because you can even hear the kids at camp where he lives. Just a little bit of a valley. I said, Bert, let me tell you what God's doing. I said, three teenagers realized they were sinners and trusted Christ as their Savior, and he forgave them. They're going to heaven now. Oh, that's great. You know? Why are we afraid to talk about our God? I'm serious. 
So I'm flying and I'm sitting next to a lady who's Catholic and my age, very intelligent businesswoman. And we're going back and forth and I'm saying, Lord, help me because I, there's nothing I could say that she didn't have a very, very good answer to. And I got this idea. I said, hey, got an idea. What? Let's pray right now. Both of us. And we're both going to pray to Mary. Got it? And when you're done praying, I'm done praying. I'm going to ask you which one of us she heard. Because if you tell me she heard both of us, that means she's omniscient and omnipresent. And if I'm not mistaken, those are attributes that only God should have. She goes, whoa, I never thought of that. I always give my card. Two weeks later, I get an email. Could you explain the salvation thing more and send me some material? Yeah. I don't attack their belief system ever. I plant seeds of doubt. So they get thinking and start searching. If you're truly a child of God, you know in your heart how you repented and believed and received Christ. You know in your heart how you turned from your sin, right? Trusted in Jesus and took him as your personal savior. You know. Do you realize that relationships matter? Every kid in your school wants a friend, yeah? Nobody wants to be left out of the circle. Every adult wants a friend. I read a Barna statistic today that says one-third of all millennials feel unloved. Then let's love them. And what does that mean? Smiling? Going into a restaurant and say, hey, I'm going to pray for my meal. Wait, can I pray for you? I've got a friend. Her name's Trista. She worked at the pizza place not far from us. And now when I go in, she goes, you can pray for me, Rand? I said, yeah, what do you want me to pray? She said, I need a better job. And I prayed for her. Now I don't see her anymore. I shouldn't have prayed that prayer, okay? <laughs> Did you know the most important relationship in all the world is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? It is not a religion. It's not a denomination. Mm-mm. It's a personal relationship with the Son of God. That's the way he designed it. For by him were all things created. This is by Jesus. That are in heaven, that are on earth, the things you can see, the things you can't see. All things were created by him. Say the last three words. Ready? And for him. Every single one of us were created to have a wonderful, unique, one-of-a-kind relationship with God. He has put his thumbprint on every single one of us. Yeah. So, Jessica, you're in heaven. Just suppose we'll say there's, I don't know, 10 million Christians. And God says to Gabriel, hey, I, I need to talk to Jessica. Go get her. What does she look like? Oh, you'll know. Because there's only one of a kind. The body of Christ is not a Mr. Potato Head. You don't take the arms and stick them in the nose like most of us did when we were kids, okay? Every one of us have our part in the body of Christ. Uniquely fashioned. Isn't that cool? Sadly, it's a relationship many don't have. Your sins have separated you from your God. You see, God's a holy God. Totally separate from sin. I am a sinner. I'm born a sinner. I choose to sin. Unless my sins are separated from me, I have to be separated from God. So how do you get your sins separated from you? Forgiveness. But this forgiveness is impossible until the debt has been paid. The wages of sin is what? What did Jesus do? Yes. He died for you. He died for me. Wow. It's a relationship that all can have. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just, that's Jesus, for the unjust, that's you and me, that he might bring us to God. Whoa. Without this, we would never be brought to God. This is what our Jesus did for us. It's a relationship all must choose. Repent ye therefore, be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, say it, shall be saved. We talked about it last night. When it comes to love, you cannot mandate love. You can't make somebody love. 
And if God did do that, he doesn't want to populate heaven with a bunch of well-programmed robots or empty-headed puppets. What does he want us to do? The Shema. The Lord God is one God. Thou shalt love him with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. And would you teach that to your children? And talk about it when you go for walks and when you sit in the house. Would you write it down and put it all over your house so you'll never, ever forget it? Wow. You know, your three friends, look down at your card. If you would be willing to share Christ with them, let me show you what will possibly happen. You know what some are going to do? Totally reject him. They go, sorry. Different strokes for different folks. That's not for me. They'll just quickly, utterly reject. Some will ignore him. Says, fine. Whatever. Do your thing. I'm going to do my thing. It's no big deal to me. Some will postpone him. You know, when I get older, I want to have some fun. I want to live life. But when I get like really, really, really old, like 32 or something, then maybe I'll think about this. Now, folks, I don't want to confuse anybody. But you don't, you got to realize you, you don't get saved just any time you want to. We don't have God on a string that we jerk it and he comes. Uh uh. My Bible clearly says, no man comes to the Father unless the Father draw him and convicts them. And as God's convicting the heart. But you know what Romans 1 teaches us in Proverbs 28? This is sad. If a person says, God, no. Leave me alone. Stop convicting me. I don't want you. The ultimate of God's wrath is not correction and chastisement. Get this. The ultimate of God's wrath is when he gets quiet. He says, really? You really want life without me? Okay. And he turns, he gives them what they desire. He turns them over to their own desires. He gives them life on earth without him and eternal life without him. Actually, number four is the one that scares me the most. Because we have churches filled with people who never read their Bibles and never witness to their friends and have no conviction when they sin and have no real desire to do right. I just listed four biblical, supernatural, godly birthmarks of all believers. As newborn babes, you will desire the sincere milk of the word. You will not but speak the things that you have seen and heard as we read in the book of Acts. Hebrews teaches us if there's no conviction, then the Holy Spirit of God doesn't live there. Because when you get saved, the Holy Spirit dwells within. You'll at least be uncomfortable when you're around sin. Now, I'm not a preacher that ever tries to talk anybody into or out of anything. I'm not. I tell you what, folks. If I never had conviction when I sin. If I didn't have a desire for the precious word of God and didn't want to see people saved, I would be scared to death that the Holy Spirit of God didn't live within. And I would go out in the woods and I'd find a tree and I'd kneel next to that tree and I'd say, God, please, please. Our desire is this. A life totally committed to God. What does commitment mean? giving everything, giving your all. If you went to the wilds in North Carolina, we have something called a blob. A blob is just a huge air mattress about as wide as this aisle from me all the way back to about Ed. And what we do is, Grace, would you stand up, please? Just stand up real quick, okay? And uh, brother, go ahead and stand up, please, okay? We wouldn't let him blob her. Let me tell you why. We don't have access to the space shuttle, okay? All right. We got, you may be seated. We kind of got a weight limit that we allow, okay? You got to be within a certain. But just suppose, Grace, you were up at camp, and he was, you were out in the end, and okay, all of a sudden, you get blobbed. You go so high, you forget everything you ever knew about swimming. You flip through the air, you come down, you hit the water. I'm lifeguarding, I'm standing there, I see you hit hard. You go way down, you come up sputtering, you go down a second time. I'm thinking, oh no, I'm going to have to get in the water. You come up, you're going to drown. You're just going to drown, you're going to lose it. 
So I jump in the water to save her. Do you think as she was going down the third time taking in water, and I just reached her, she'd say, stop! Okay, Rand, are you certified? <laughs> Red Cross, uh, YMCA, where did you get your certification? In this situation, which carry do you think would be the most advantageous? No! If she was drowning, you know what she'd do? Take her hands, grab a hold of me, totally 100% commit herself to me to save her. Doing nothing by her own strength. That's salvation. It's not Jesus plus going to church. Read my Bible so maybe I'm good enough for God to accept me when I get there. Good works outweighing bad works. Uh -uh. No, 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 no. Total commitment, Lord. I trust you. I don't deserve it. I never will. I trust you. If you're here tonight, right now in this room, and you know how to read, raise your hand. Sweet. Wow, we're in America. Yeah, this is great. You all know how, if you know how to read, you know how to witness. We forget sometimes the power of the written word, and written in a form that's easy to understand. For instance, this is a bridge track. You can get it in many different forms and languages and so forth. I like it because of the way it starts. If God's purpose for mankind is to honor, serve, and fellowship with him, then what happened that destroyed that perfect relationship? It doesn't just immediately go, hey, you want to go to heaven or hell? Who wants to go to hell? Nobody. And we haven't even talked about sin. What are you saved from, okay? So this is God's purpose for us. Well, man has a problem. And that problem is sin. Remember, we are saved from our sin. Not just hell and consequences and lake of fire stuff. We are saved from sin. The power of sin. The presence of sin in our life. The middle letter of sin is I. Your sin, your iniquity is separated between you and your God. And if they start to argue a little bit, have you ever had an attitude with mom and dad? Have you ever cheated on a test? Have you ever gotten so angry you actually took God's name in vain? I, I just quoted three of the Ten Commandments. You see, the Ten Commandments were simply given to be like a school teacher, to teach us that we are sinners because God loves us so. And these weren't rules to make us miserable. These were enlightening truths to show us that we had need of a Savior, okay? But as we've said, sin has a penalty. The wages of sin is, say it again, death. Death. All have sinned and come short of God's glorious perfection. You get that? We fall short. We can't quite make it. How many times do you have to lie to be a liar? Once. How many times do you have to steal to be a thief? How many times do you have to sin to be a sinner? Once. We fall short because Jesus never sinned. We fall short. The wages of sin is death. If we die with that sin wall still there, we will spend forever without God. That is what the Bible calls hell, but it's not what God wants. I'm preaching at the wilds in North Carolina, probably a thousand kids. I work hard to make sure that they listen. If I can't control them, you can't reach them. One boy right in the middle, big boy, about 6'4", wouldn't stop talking, had an attitude, kept bothering the people around him. So I finally said, okay, dude, okay, you know who you are. No more. He got so angry, he stood up. He took his Bible and threw it across the auditorium, and he told me to go to hell. Now, what do you do if you're in front of a thousand teenagers and somebody screams out and tells you to go to hell? You look at him and say, buddy, I can't. I can't. I've trusted Jesus to forgive me for my sin. I can't. I'll never, ever experience the darkness of hell or the loneliness of hell. I'll never experience eternal regrets knowing that I'll never, ever be around God or anything godly ever again. Hell is the horrible home of no hope. So you know what we do in our selfish, proud ways? We do. We're all made this way. We want to be our own little gods and take care of it ourselves. 
We don't want to just trust. Because if we don't trust and we can earn it, then we can get a pat on the back when we get to heaven that we're pretty good people. We're not pretty good people. We're sinners deserving of eternal punishment. And because it's all of Christ, he gets all the glory. Good works, religion, money, morality, they all fall short. They don't quite make it, except one. Jesus never sinned. Jesus came to earth to die for us, but sometimes we forget he came to earth to live for us. He had little brothers and sisters. We read that in scripture. There was Jesus and Joseph and Joseph and James. And I'm thinking, you mean Joseph and Mary even alliterated their names and then Simon shows up. I don't know where he came from, but anyway. He was mocked. People didn't even know he was God. His own brothers didn't know he was God until after he was 30 years of age. He got picked on. And I'm sure Mary, she knew. And when one of his brothers went, Mom, Jesus started it. No, he didn't. <laughs> mm -mm. Jesus came to earth to live, to die. Wow. It's an amazing, amazing, wonderful good news story. He's the Messiah. He is the propitiation. He is our substitute. And get this, he's the substitute of the three friends you have written on your card. He wants them to know that he died for them. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. I love those two words, everlasting life. There's eternal death, there's everlasting life. What do you want for your three friends? God promises eternal life, no condemnation. Pass from death to life. It's the only way that we can bridge this eternal separation from God eternal death called hell. So just suppose you're sitting at a Starbucks, you invited one of those friends, and you buy them a latte, and you're talking, and then you say, hey, if, if you don't mind, I told you before there's something I really need to talk to you about, and I have got to share with you one of the greatest, most important things in my life. Just bear with me, okay? And I promise, I won't be on your case the rest of your life, but please hear me out, okay? And you pull out a little bridge track and you begin reading through this. When you get to the end, it's going to be this picture. And you ask them, are you here or here? So I was sitting at a ball game on the ground, soccer game, my kids were playing. And this kid, about 15, comes over and for whatever reason sits next to me. We get talking, lives with that and uncle, tough home, unchurched. What do you do? So I'm a camp director, Christian camp. Really? What's that like? Well, come on. There's an open door, okay? So I shared the gospel with him. He looked at me. He goes, I need that. I said, would you like to pray and trust Christ and ask him to forgive you right now? He said, well, I would, but I don't know how to do that. I said, just talk to God like you're talking to me. He said, okay. Crossed his arms, looked up, closed his eyes. He said, hey, God, if ain't nobody needs to be saved, I do. And he went ahead and prayed and accepted the Lord. But when he got done, he didn't know what to do. So he just sat there. Finally, I looked up and he sat there going like this. And after the longest time, he finally went like this. Well, thank you, and looked at me. He didn't know you're supposed to say in Jesus' name, amen, or as we pray in the name of Jesus. Well, thank you. Could you imagine because of the courage and compassion that God puts into your heart, one at a time, those three friends, you share the truth with them. And they look at you and say, this is what I've been looking for. And they bow their heads and they trust Christ. And you even hear them pray, Lord, thank you for saving me. And then when they open their eyes, they look at you and say, and thank you for not being afraid 
to share this wonderful truth with me. I'm telling you folks, God has not given the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Don't be ashamed of the testimony of our God. Let's bow our heads in prayer, please. First of all, as we've walked through the gospel message four times tonight, how many of you just say, Rand, I just want, first of all, to say to my Lord, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord. And tell him right now in your heart, thank you, Lord, for saving me. Thank you. Now, if you told him that, just raise your hand so I can see, okay? God bless you. You can put him down. Question. Maybe you're here tonight and you've been a part of the church or part of this Christian thing for a long time. Keep your eyes closed, okay? Even, even in the back, keep your eyes closed, please. And you might be here tonight and say, Rand, you know, I get it. I, I, I didn't understand it this way before. I now understand. And you would just say, Rand, I'm not a Christian. I, I've, I've never put my complete faith and trust in Jesus for what he has done for me. I've tried to help him and tried to be good, and it's kind of like a works thing. I get it. And you would just say, Rand, pray for me, because I, I don't know if I'm truly saved. I know I'm a sinner. I understand what Jesus did, but I've never trusted Christ and Christ alone and committed myself to him. Just pray for me that God will give me the courage to get with somebody, even tonight or in the very near future. I'm not sure I'm a Christian. Please pray for me. Can I see your hand, please? God bless you there. God bless you there. Others, please pray for me. I'm not sure. Don't, don't be scared, okay? Again, I'm not here to embarrass you. I want you to know the privilege of knowing that your sins are forgiven. It is the most amazing thing. Even in your seat tonight, I've explained the gospel well. And I still feel so inadequate. But it's an admission I'm a sinner being willing to turn from that sin, knowing that Jesus paid the penalty for my sin, and just saying, Lord, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God who came to earth as a man, lived a perfect life, and died for me, and I want you to be my personal Savior. You can even pray that tonight. And if you do, would you come by and tell the pastor or his wife, come and tell me, we'd love to know, okay? Okay, Christian, you have a little card with three names. Here's what I'm going to ask. Would you be willing to tell God tonight, Lord, before Christmas, I'll either get with them one by one, or I'll invite them to church, or I'll just give them like a bridge track or another one and say, hey, I want you to read this, and then sometime we'll get coffee and talk about this. But I will engage the conversation. Again, many may say, no, thank you, and reject him. And don't feel like a loser, okay? All we need to do is share Christ, pray, meet people, and tell them about Jesus. If you are willing in the next couple months to share salvation, the precious gospel, with those three friends. Can I just see your hands high, please? Just raise them up high. Keep them up there for just a minute, okay? Okay, thank you. You can put them down. Look at me. Everybody look this way. I just counted about 35 or 40 hands. That's 120 people. They're going to hear the precious gospel before Christmas. So what do you think we need what needs to happen in their hearts even before you share Christ with them? I want my God to be convicting them and show them a need of a Savior. So I want to take up an offering right now. But the only thing I want you to put in that offering, I don't even think we'll use an offering plate, is that little white card. Okay? It has three names on it. And if you would pass them all in, I want the pastor to take them, and he and his staff can pray for these individuals. I don't know, maybe you can take them, put them on a list, and pass out for everybody. It doesn't have to have your name, and we're not trying to trick anybody. 
But I believe in a God that answers prayer. And if you pray according to his will, right? He hears us. And God is not willing that any should perish, right? So if you just pass them in, if you would, just pass them in. And then I'm going to close here in just a second, okay? A hundred and twenty people hearing the gospel. That's pretty cool. It really is. And all of you have friends that I'll never meet. I met a guy today at Planet Fitness. He said, where are you from? I said, New Hampshire. He said, could you do me a favor? I said, what? He said, next time you're in Cincinnati, could you please, please bring me some real maple syrup? And as I'm leaving, I said, yeah, I, honestly, I would, and I would. I would have got it. If I'm coming back in a week or so, I would get the maple syrup, I'd bring it back, and I'd tell, give him the gospel. I said, I got something a lot sweeter than this, okay? And I'd share it with him. And then he asked me on my way out, when are you going to be in Cincinnati next? I said, I don't know. It could be a year or so. Oh, I'm just going to call one of your friends. Forget it. <laughs> okay, so those are the kind of little things that open the door to be able to share the gospel with people. And it's just a matter of fact, okay? A matter of fact. So do you believe God when he writes stuff down for us? He has not given us a spirit of fear. Courage, compassion, and confidence to share with these friends the most precious, wonderful story in all the universe. Now, let's pray. Father, I'm going to ask you to do something that only you can do. There's 120, maybe more, a little bit less names written on cards. And I know you know every one of them. Lord, would you please bring something into their lives to make them aware that their sinners are making hungry for the gospel? Lord, I know you can do this. Would you draw them to yourself and convict them? Do something to show that you really love them. Have them be turning the radio and hear a gospel message. Just something to stir their hearts. And then as you have given these dear people here in this church the courage and the compassion and the confidence of your precious gospel. And as they set up these times and meet with these individuals, Lord, I'm just asking, would you please save them? Show them their need for you. Now, our prayer is that they wouldn't reject you. And if it bothers us, I know, Lord, it grieves you. But I do pray that you'll work in their hearts. Draw them to yourself. And then as they hear your precious gospel, Lord, would you please save them? Lord, it'd be so cool to come visit this church in a couple years. And it'd be twice as many people here. Well, at least 120 more who because they heard your precious gospel trusted you. Thank you for being a saving God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Pastor. Thank you, Rand. <clears throat> this, is, uh, this is pretty precious right here because this represents the names of people that Jesus died for and um, that I know he wants to save and I know he loves them uh, dearly. And so, um, you know, we will pray for these people. Um, what I think we might even do is compile a big list of all the names and maybe not necessarily put the names of, of us to, on there, but just have a big list of names that we could all be praying for. And, um, you know, give us, give updates of, of how things are going. And if somebody gets saved, let us know so we can rejoice over that. But I'm excited about it. I'm excited about um the decision and the commitment to share the gospel with these people. See what the Lord will do. I know he wants to save them. And so uh, we have uh, a great God who loves them very much. Well, thank you, Rand, uh, for these last five or six messages and for uh, the, the days that you've spent here and that you've given up time with your, your wife and, and the ministry there to minister to us. And it has been an incredible blessing to us. Um, and so we we're grateful for that. I do encourage you. Um, I, be, I dove into the book he gave me, and it's one of those meditations books, and it's, it's very helpful. And he's got various topics out there. Check out Amazon.com and get some of those. I know they'll be a help to you. Uh, good devotionals, good time to, to meditate on the Word. And those topics are very uh, real to what we're going through in life. So check those out, please. Make sure if you get a chance to come by and just thank him. 
and uh, we'll be praying for the wilds and uh, for the ministry there. And uh, thank you again for your, your service to us. All right, let's stand together, please. Don't forget Saturday, big day. Be praying for that. Be praying that we'll have an opportunity to reach people there and invite them back on Sunday to preach the gospel. We've been talking about heaven on Sunday morning. And so we're going to preach the gospel and tell them how they can know for sure that they'll go there someday. So uh, we'll, we'll do our best to invite them on Sunday morning. And then, of course, be back Sunday if you can. Uh, and we'll have another day of worshiping and serving the Lord. Thank you. You are dismissed.